So we, there were two questions that were asked to the to our uh, colleagues for preparing their presentations. Considering advancing technology and involving society, what issues are there on the horizon in radiological protection? What could should be done? Ideally, where should radiological protection be a decade from now, and what is ICRP's role in getting there? I think we are not necessarily obliged to respond to this question, but this is just to guide the discussion and to orient your, your questions to, to the panelists. So, who would like to, to start first? First question. Or do, would you like, maybe I give you two minutes, three minutes each to the key points about the, the previous of the morning presentations, your, your first reactions. Yeah, okay. you and so that we can, we can launch the, the debate with, the, with the, the audience. Okay, so I, I think that, as I pointed out in the lecture, I think that we should teach um, about radiation associated risks or about radiation risk or, or teach, how should I say this? Place radiation or just as one, as an example of um, risk factors um, associated with modern technologies and complex technologies that we have in the society. And what is important is to um, yeah, teach students uh, that they have to take um, informed decisions and that this will be an important, this is an important issue for the functioning of, uh, of democratic societies. But, yeah. Not, we, we shouldn't be teaching about ri radiation risks alone because nobody will buy this. And we shouldn't be teaching them about um, facts. We should be giving them the opportunity to take decisions. Just a short comment about your, your points here. You were really hesitating, looking for your words at the beginning of, of your comment, which is clearly demonstrating that if we need to change a little bit the perspective we are, we are looking at the situation. In the past, we have used uh, words like uh, convincing people, teaching people, and so on and so on. And we, we get used to that, but this is not the right perspective. And it was interesting to, to listen to your hesitation at the beginning. <laughs> yes, um, David. Uh, is this on? Uh, yes, yes, yeah, it, it's, it's working. Um, so I think all I would say is to add to what I've just been saying. To me, what would be good within 10 years would be to get environmental considerations embedded in thinking about radiological protection. That's not to say that we don't think about it, but to explicitly demonstrate how it's been considered and to go through that process. So that when and if we're ever asked questions about that role of radiation protection, then we can actually demonstrate that, that it's in place. That, okay. that would be what I would add. I think you made well your point during your presentation about the, the, the need to rely on science, sciences and to be aware about what's going on in, in, in the scientific literature. But I'd like to have your point on what your two colleagues said this morning. You have probably listened to them carefully. So what was what they inspired to you? Uh, very much. I mean, well, as you just said, the word educate, um, being a, in a university is actually a word I dislike very much. Um, I think we have to get away from the word educate, and we have to inform and help people to make decisions. So I very much agree uh, with what was said there. Uh, and from the radon point of view, it was very much about um, the, <coughs> the multi-stresses and so on. I think there's lots of uh, common ground there. Okay, thank you. Per, reaction about this morning? Yeah, reaction. It's, uh, I mean, I think what has been a topic in, in many of, oh, in all the, uh, the presentations, and which we also think is important in Radon, is the, to interact with society and interact with all parts of society because some of the problems can't be solved only by the radiation protection part, but has to involve and include uh, other other um, tools uh, and other issues. For example, with the radon, how, how important it was to be a public health is issue, how the important it was that it 
involve both the health sector, the building sector, and, and this work going together. So I think interaction uh, is, is an important wor word. Uh, you, you can say education on information and communication, but interaction and learn, and that's, I think, also for, that has shown to be very important for Radon. The other things, which is the risk, how do we communicate the risk, and I think we should try to link together issues like where people are very afraid, uh, which we may say that that's not necessary, with uh, examples where they should maybe be a little bit more afraid and try to analyze that together and, and try to see what is, the, what is behind this different way of approaching. I mean, example, mobile yeah, mobile phones is maybe not uh, yeah, CRP, sorry, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, other issues. <laughs> and, and for example, radon, why, 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 why is the perception so different? And the last thing is uh, the same as we see in radon, environmental protection. If ICRP should do something with this, it has to interact with the, with the rest of society and environmental, environmental societies and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so interaction is a very important word. Yeah, I think we have to adopt some sort of holistic view where it's not only the problem of the risk, but it is how this risk match with the society. And as you said, Radon is not a, it's a matter of perception of, of the risk, but it's also a matter of building uh, the construction of, of buildings and a whole range of issues. I think it was probably the merit of ICRP 103 to put some light on the so-called existing exposure situations, because this is really where you, you can get aware about we are living with radiation, radiation that there from, from the beginning of, of life on this planet, but also, and, and, and much before, and also um, radiation that we have enhanced because our behavior, we, we fly, we, we, we dig mines, we do a lot of things, and this is changing also the pattern. And we live with that. And what is, at the end, what is important, to, as we know that there may be some potential risk, problem is to know what to do in which circumstances. That, that's what is the important point. Any other points you would like to, uh, to add at this now before I ask the audience? No? Okay. So, who would like to raise a first question or make a comment? Yes? Please? Yeah, so um, I think uh, we can learn a lot from studying uh, other industries, like um, the aircraft in industry. If we look at the, at the um, death rate per, per million mile traveled from the 1960s to the present, it's dropped enormously. And, and that's, of course, because the probability and, and the number of people that were in the air is, is, is very much larger uh, in any numbers than we would care to compare to the number of of nuclear facilities around uh, the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the planet. So to me, we've demonstrated that we, 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 uh, we face new technological risks and new combined risks. And, and at, after each thing happens, we improve. So I think it's important when you talk about risk to break it up into two components. One is the, one is the, the incident probability of occurring and the other one is the probability that we will be able to mitigate its effects before, we, bef before it happens. So I think every time we have a nuclear problem, we, we, have, we have found ways uh, so that the plants can be operated more and more successfully. So I think it's important to communicate that, that these aren't the same kinds of risks of an of a asteroid hitting the planet. That, uh, that, that these are risks that are more under our control and that technologically we do learn from our mistakes and that, uh, and that it's an evolving um, risk that, that we are facing and that, and that resources spent on, on mitigation um, for, for accidents um, is, um, is uh, important and that we have made progress, and we will, will continue to make progress. Thank you. I think it's, it's a good point. I mean, learning from experience. Uh, we, we used to say now that the system of radiological protection is based on science, sound science, uh, social values and ethics. 
there are values there, and also experience. And experience is crucial, as you said, the, the learning curve in the aviation, but there is also a, le a learning curve in, 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 uh, with dealing with our medical installation, nuclear installation, and so on and so on. But then the question is, do we have to teach people about the, how to understand that the probability is going down? That's very difficult. I think what is, what is important is to tell stories, is to, to develop a narrative about this history, this long process, how we have learned from the past, how it was embarked in the new settings. So this is, this is what I think is important, to develop a narrative about this experience and not pretending that, you, you know, if you focus on the risk with people, it's, you just phase out all, this, all the rest, which is the most important, I think. Chris would like to, to uh, comment on that. Ah, okay. You were ahead. Okay, thank you. To remind me, okay. Maybe, maybe to go along the lines you just said this, this, this morning and, and yesterday, we learned a lot about advances in science. And I think one of the things that's been, that tends to happen, or has been suggested anyway, in terms of perception of risk, is that there's a, sometimes there's confusion raised when scientists don't look like they all agree on, on the same thing. And I think actually, that we're not supposed to agree. We're supposed to disagree. Science is about learning things and about coming up with, with a new model. The, there was a, a, a sculpture in the, in the Brookhaven National Laboratory at Accelerator. It, it was a beautiful brass thing of showing particles and, and accelerator stuff. And it was titled, The Standard Model Rejected. Because I think that's what happens. Everything changes. But my question to the panel is, how do you deal with that? How do you express in, these, in, in what Andre was talking about in teaching children to, to and high school kids to think and to, to ask questions. How do you teach them that science is supposed to ask questions and things are supposed to change? Okay, shouldn't we answer? Maybe? Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, okay, if I may. Okay. All right, I, um, yeah, I, I think one, one important uh, thing that we have to, let's say, uh, explain to young people is that scientists do, do not agree and that is this is inherent to scientific knowledge uh, but this is something that indeed people don't understand they see scientists quarreling and then they think well they don't know uh, but this in fact is it is true we don't know and while and what Tom said we should inform about progress of safety our progress in safety culture or in, in, in you, you mentioned aeroplanes of course, we have to inform the public that we are doing what we can to um, protect them in, in an increasingly good way or sufficient way. But, uh, but then we have to humbly admit that there, <laughs> we make mistakes. And I have, I have mentioned this problem of um, the cesium-137 uptake in, in sheep. But another very prominent example how we made a mistake how we screwed things up is Freon. Freon that was used as a coolant in refrigerators, which was in the 1940s sold as the perfect coolant. And then, whoops, in the 1980s, we discovered, oh, there is something like an ozone hole. I mean, how could we know in the 1940s that, uh, <laughs> that ozone is, or that, that Freon is going to lead to, to, to the formation of an ozone hole? Ozone hole. It's just, I, th I think it's a good example for the problems that we face in modern societies. We are developing technologies that we don't have time to, to test. And of course we run into mistakes, but we have to admit this. And then we, say, we have to say, well, yeah, we are, we are on the safe side. And, but we have to include, again, we have to include the uh, society into decision making in, in the way that we show them, well, this is how it is. This is the best of we know. We, and, but we have to have, take a decision. We have to have refrigerators. We have to use a coolant. This is, today, this is the best what we know. Uh, and it may, it may turn out that by having a dialogue with the society, we, we get good ideas <laughs> from, from the society also. Chris. Thanks. Thanks. Just reflecting on the ideas of education informing narrative and so on, 
uh, it seems to me we don't need to train a generation of six billion people who are going to be RP specialists. <laughs> people don't really need to know what is alpha, beta, gamma, planned, existing, emerging, emergency, DCRLs. That's expert business. And sure, people should have access to this information and learn if they wish. Uh, but there's a big difference, I think, between air flight or driving a car or crossing the street or eating a sandwich or consuming peanuts and radiation. Uh, two, in fact, I think. One is the invisibility of radiation makes it difficult. You can see an airplane, you can't see gammas. Uh, and the other is uh, the fear of the unknown and the, and, the, and the familiar versus the unfamiliar. Everyone knows what an airplane is. Many people fly. No one think of it, it thinks of it. Very few people think of it as dangerous. Most people think of it as safe, but we see every year an accident, 100 people killed. I mean, it's, this happens. Uh, so I don't think the solution is really to teach people about the risk exactly. I don't think the solution is to teach people more about uh, radiation protection exactly. I think the challenge is to make radiation less special, less mysterious, less something dealt with only by a special club of radiation protection professionals, and just one of those things that's around us all the time. And that's difficult to do, and we're not going to change that overnight. But maybe in a generation, if we talk about it in schools and in regular narratives that radiation's just here, it's not special, uh, we might make a difference in the next 50 years, but not in the next 10 years. Thank you, Chris. That reminds me of an anecdote. Uh, I was, a long time ago, at the beginning of my career, I was attending a meeting and on risk assessment and management. That was the, the topic, fashionable topic in the early, late 70s, early 80s. And there was, I was by chance uh, for lunch at the same table of the head of the nuclear safety in France and the head of uh, civil aviation. And they were talking together. It was very gentleman, but at the same time, they were teasing them a little bit. And uh, there was a point where the guy from the, the civil aviation was a little bit nervous. And he said to, to the other one, he said, you know, there is a difference between us. Because the, the nuclear guy was pretending that we are very safe. And uh, you know, it was before Chernobyl. And, <laughs> and uh, the, the guy from aviation said, you know, there is a big difference between us. We have never pretended that there will be a time where planes will stop to fall. And that was, and that we are safe. And that, that was very important for me to, to, of course, aviation is safe, relatively, but people managing aviation, they don't pretend that there will be no, no more accident. I mean, this is, and there are people who, when they enter a plane, they are afraid. Whatever is the probability and whatever is the record. And you cannot change that. I mean, this is how we have to deal. But they don't want to go swimming to the United States. They want to, they want, <laughs> they want to be there very quickly. OK, sorry. To, next question. I'd like to add another little bit of perspective and get your thoughts on this. All of the information is only useful in a context, in a decision. If it's just information floating out there in the cloud, it's just out there in the cloud. It suddenly becomes important to someone when they're faced with, do I or do I not do something? Do I live here or do I live somewhere else? Do I wish to go somewhere or do I wish to remain where I am? Do I want to sell my house or not? Which in the United States is what usually actually results in someone looking at radon. How do we position our information so that we best help people make the actual decisions? Because as long as it's just out there, we'll have this philosophical debate. You won't have a real engagement. The second, as in the response to food. The second you say, oh, well, am I, going to, am I going to eat this food? And you take it and you get it measured and you get some information and then you have a decision in a context. Without a decision, I'm not convinced there's any value in the information. Very good point. Christian?
Yes, thank you very much. Uh, of course, I'm very much in favor of interaction and uh, communication and teaching. I do this since about 50 years, teaching in universities, in the university. But I also think that experience, as it was mentioned, is most important. If we take the radon, when uh, in the 90s, the radon concentrations were measured in the Erzgebirge, in the Erz Mountain, where we have the, the uranium mines. In some houses, the radon concentration was 20,000 and more acre per cubic meter. And people lived there since generations. Of course, <laughs> we tried to bring this down by uh, changing especially the ground in the house and so on. If we come to reference levels, and would we would go down to, let's say, 100 becquerel, which is sometimes discussed, then we would have to evacuate in southern Germany some regions. And I think the experience would tell us that this is not possible. So one thing is we certainly cannot set those limits for radon in houses, but we have to have re reference levels as we do it in the moment. And we certainly have to also to adjust this to the regions which we have in order to have a good societal, societal impact. As we always in ICRP, with radiation exposures, it's always said societal impact is also very important. So I think this has, been, has to be taken into account very much. Thank you, Christian, to remind us that what, what we aimed at with our system is to do the best given the circumstances, looking at the whole picture, taking into account societal and economic uh, considerations. Thank you. Next, oh, we have one, one question here, two there, first. Uh, Osa Wiklund, SSM. I will change slightly from risk uh, to protection of animals and environment. Uh, as we heard from Don, um, ICRP is embarking into the field of uh, veterinary patients and it's a connection to the livestock uh, populations that you mentioned and I wondered could any one of you elaborate a bit on the rationale for going into that domain protecting as I suppose individual uh, uh, not just the population as such but individuals uh, animals Chris, do you want to, to say a few words on that? Thank you for the question and for putting me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this was discussed, uh, for those of you who don't know, we had a meeting of the main commission just before this colloquium. Also thanks to SSM for the support for that. Um, and one of the topics raised was whether we should look at um, the protection of patients in veterinary care. <clears throat> We had a group that was set up uh, about a year ago, a little less than a year ago, to give us some advice on this question, led by uh, Jan Pentry, an emeritus member of the main commission. And the decision was to go ahead with trying to do something. Uh, we are going to expand the work of one of our task groups to look at not just uh, protection of um, staff and the public in veterinary care, but also patients. How exactly we'll do that? we're still working out or we're looking at it. And the reason here is that um, unlike uh, protecting a forest where if one tree dies, it's not such a big deal. I mean, that naturally happens. You want to protect the ecosystem or the group or the population. For veterinary patients, uh, at least for pets, 
you often want to protect that dog. You're not going to try and protect the population of dogs. You're trying to protect that dog, that cat, uh, that valuable horse, that valuable breeding cow, and so on. So this is where we're looking at protection of individual animals, not in the environment, because that's just not sensible and reasonable. That's not environmental protection for the most part, except for some very protected species. Uh, we're looking at protection of uh, individual valued animals. Uh, we may go beyond that, but that's the what we're looking at right now. And maybe David wants to say more about uh, no. Okay. Well, just just to reinforce that, and I think that the link to the environment is the uh, conservation protected species. So, in some some instances, it's the individual uh, individuals are a small group um, around a, a location that is your protected population. Um, so there are some synergies, but it is very much, as you said, it's about value and the societal value that you place on that animal or the individual value you place on that animal. Yes, there is also the ethical dimension about yeah. the, and, and the effects of the, the owner of the pets and all this has to be taken into consideration. And uh, I mean, this is where we go towards that. There, as you are going back to the environment, there was a question I'd like to ask you, uh, David. You, you mentioned very briefly at the beginning of your talk the question of the protection of the resources. Mm -hmm. uh, this has not been very much developed so far by ICRP, but we are challenged on this issue with the question, for example, of uh, uh, post-accident situations. Mm -hmm. Uh, long-term uh, evolution of the contamination, for example, in groundwater. Uh, and uh, we are also concerned with the, by trying to protect people, we, in, we introduce uh, protective actions that may have a profound impact on the environment, like, you know, m massive decontamination like it was done in, 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 in Fukushima. So how, how are you looking at that? What, what's your view on that? Well, I <coughs> Going back to the idea of what we're talking about for protection of the environment, I think it's embedding those kind of questions into the thinking as you're going through the decision-making process. It's thinking about the consequences of if you remove all the topsoil, you're removing all of the fertility, you're removing all of the seed bank and so on. Is that going to have a bigger consequence than the radiation exposure and, and to the wildlife that's present there at the moment? And I think that's the question that we need to start thinking about so you can start to value those two components and then decide what your actions are going to be. Mm -hmm. um, but it's part of the decision-making process. So. Yeah. yeah, I think we are confronted to those who are dealing with the, this type of situation are, are confronted to the situation. But what I wanted to, to emphasize is the fact that we have been maybe a little bit silent in our yeah. r r publications on that particular aspect. And that maybe this deserves to be looked at more carefully in, 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 in the future, based on the experience, once yes. again. And so, that's, so just to illustrate that, there is a task group that's working on that topic at the moment in terms of the existing exposed situation. So task group 105 that some of us are involved with is actually thinking about those types of issues and the experience. And goes back to what you said earlier about trying to put a narrative down to explain how decisions might be made, how they were made, and what can we learn from that process? So, yeah. Thank you. Any other? Yes, please, over there. Sec first rows, and then over there. Dave Rogers from Canada. I'm I've been looking at the words up there, and, and we haven't talked about evolving society and, and its impact. And I'm, I'm concerned that uh, in the United States, for example, they just elected a president a couple of years ago who basically ran on, on getting rid of the experts, okay, uh, and, and expertise. And then, and again, I know nothing in detail about what happened in Japan at Fukushima, but the, the press that I read about it was because said that there was, had been a lot of uh, ignoring of the regulations and sort of under the table agreements between the power companies and the regulators. So I think there's a great deal of skepticism coming in our societies, and it's not just the United States, of course. And I wonder, uh, I just don't know where that's going to lead, where, where expertise is no longer something which is valued because it's not trusted by the, by the majority of the population. Do you have a view on that? Yeah, well, I, I think the, the, the problem is that people fall in the trap of <laughs> following 
um, politicians who give simple answers to complex problems. And that is, again, I mean, it's, it's again what I, what I was trying to, to say. We have to educate. Sorry, I used the word. We have to teach uh, about we are in a society where there are complex problems. And we cannot just close our eyes or put, stick the head into the sand. And you have to cope with this. And then you have to take uh, right or clever decisions. No, but you should, we should educate, we should treat, we should uh, teach, discuss. <laughs> yeah. <No. I laughs> um, Pro probably we should interact with people who are concerned to learn how to, what are their concerns, to listen to their concerns and to try to find the ways to address their concerns. Certainly, uh, expertise will be there in the future. There is no question about that. The problem is people don't question our expertise. They question, they, this is a matter of trust, this is a matter of values. They question your values. What are you thinking as a father? What are you, are you able to understand my problem? They don't question the fact that we, we master becquerels and millisieverts. They don't care about that. They care about who is this guy who is talking to me? What are his values? May I, is it possible for me to trust him? to find a solution for my problem. This is the issue. Okay. Yes, please. You are raising your hand since yeah. a long time. No, no, yes, I just wanted to jump in here. I, I think the flavor of the discussion today, of course, is very much on perception and education and information and so on. Most scientists uh, suffer from a speech defect. We cannot say the words we don't know. And underlying this is the need for more research. That there's a lot of very basic, very fundamental questions where we simply have no answers. And, and we can start listing them. It, it's not even very hard. And the truth is that a lot of the disagreement uh, between the experts, and I don't think disagreement between experts is a bad thing, but a lot of that is rooted in the fact that we don't know. We haven't done the research. And we need to make that case. It's fine to communicate, but what do we communicate? We should communicate something that we feel that we are reasonably safe or certain about when we communicate. I, I like David Cobblestone's presentation when he showed the ambiguity in some of the data. And that's exactly the discussions we should have. And I think that's the discussions we should have in this room. We should discuss what we know and what we don't know. And, and it's not just communication. It, it's also uh, yeah. reaching the level of, of informed knowledge. So you are now on yeah, the grid. Yeah, I, I want to answer Seren, <laughs> because Seren, I agree with you. But I, I, I see a, a danger in what you say. In, in, I see a trap in which I think we fell in Europe, and I think you fell in the USA as well, is that we say, and the trap is, you give us more money, we do research, and we solve problems. We will know what is the risk after low doses of radiation. We will never know. I mean, we can maybe we'll go down in the, but we will never know because uncertainty is inherent to and answer and un, or lack of knowledge. We will never know. There will always be questions, open questions. But, but you cannot argue that research has not advanced. It has advanced. Of course, it has advanced. But if you, if you look at radiation uh, risks from, say, uh, radiotherapy, I mean, that, uh, the, the papers yeah. are being published by the day. Yes, right? and we should say we, we do research and we do our best to keep we, you we safe, but let's not, let's not uh, you know, tell people that once we will solve problems in 20 years. I mean, this is what we have in, 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 in Melody, for example, in the, in the platform in Europe. <laughs> we promise that within 20 years, there is a roadmap. We will, yeah, in 2030, we will know. <laughs> Ooh, dangerous. Yes, yes, please. So panelists have to say yeah, that. Uh, I mean, I'm just following up on this, uh, this trust issue. Uh, and, and as you did discuss, I mean, you can say science and all of these things. But uh, it's very imp important to, at least if you look at the accident which has happened, uh, it is uh, in the backbone of your mind. It's, oh, the first thing you have to do is to say, don't scare people. Uh, it's, it's very easy. At least that was the... Uh, information crisis after the Chernobyl, that you were very fast to show that you had control and that you knew everything. And I think that's still in the mentality of radiation protection people to be afraid of scaring people. 
that means that you may say things you will regret later on. And, and I, I think uh, at least the experience we have is that when you, when for example something happened and you go out and give the comments, to say that you don't know, it's much more credible than say that we think this is not any problem. Uh, if you put it on like to 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 really communicate that this it may be complicated and we don't know everything, but we are doing this and this, and we have this and this information from that. So the trust and to to be able to say that you don't know, I think it's something which we still have some problem uh, to do because it's it's still this um, in the back uh, back of our, our head that we should not scare unnecessary. Yeah, I think it's a good point, a very good point. So you want to add something, just two quick things. David. Yeah, um, so I, I completely agree about the funding issue. Um, however, the funders expect us to be able to provide that solution. So that's part of the difficulty. So we have to put, educate how are we going to do it? We should educate them. Yeah, educate's probably good in that sense. <laughs> <laughs> but coming back to educate, <laughs> in my quotes, actually what I think we need to give to people is the critical skills to be able to understand the arguments. I think when, when I try this with my students, I teach my students energy and society. Um, we talk about whether nuclear power is the right thing, whether renewables are the right thing. And what I try and get them to think about is, I don't care what the answer is, you said that earlier. It's giving them the skills and the understanding so they can go into the information, they can listen to the, the various sides, they can listen to the experts from different sides. They can make up their own mind because they have the skills. Do I trust this person is part of that, but more is also, can I verify what they're saying? Can I find the other information? Where is the weight of evidence type approach? And those are the skills I think we need to be providing to the younger generation um, coming through to actually help us in the longer term. Last question to Claire. <laughs> the privilege of the chair. <laughs> it's okay, I'd just like to follow up exactly on that because when we met with the liaison organisations on Tuesday afternoon, that precise point was actually mentioned partly in relation to uh, radiological protection in medicine, but the words used by Maria Perez of WHO was, we have to empower the citizens. Absolutely. And I think that is precisely what, um, what David's saying there. And in fact, we've taken that on, or hope we're going to take that on board as one of the messages, is that we're saying, what is ICRP's role going to be in getting us into the next decade of radiological protection? Or well, maybe that's what we have to do, is try and give people the information to help empower them make their own decisions and not just tell them what to do, basically. So, thank, thank you. you, Claire. This is exactly what I wanted to, to, to say as my concluding <laughs> remarks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's perfect. It's perfect that it's coming from you because it gives the, the perspective for all of us at ICRP and it gives also some, maybe some ideas for, for, for all of you who are embarked in research projects and in, in different activities related to radiation protection. The way we, we want to keep a good base, a good science to, to found our, our system. And I mean, the presentation by David was a, a, a good example on how you have to treat scientific information in a fair way, in a transparent way, balancing the, is it true, is it not true, and to this, and going further. And we have also opened today a very interesting discussion about how to address, let's say, the public, the citizens. And I think we, we have not to criticize what has been done in the past in terms of risk perception, risk communication. I mean, that was a, a process of understanding what is at stake. But we have to go one step further, and uh, as Claire said, to empower the, 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 the people. And to do that, we need to develop a narrative which goes far beyond educating and, and training people. Well, with this, I, the session is, is now closed. I thank you, uh, panelists. You made fantastic presentations. <laughs>